Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of the Style and Vibes podcast. Today, we are joined by one of my good friends, long time in other business, Lexi. Um, <laughs> I've known Lexi for years. Mm-hmm. She's done some really great, amazing work in the PR space, which we are going to talk about. And she has an amazing, she's also an entrepreneur. She has a number of businesses that we are going to talk about, but we have a special one that we're going to talk about in depth today. So welcome, Lexi. See how are you? Hi. Good to see you, babe. You look so good. You're, you're thank glowing. you. I did good good lighting, enough. Uh? <laughs> <laughs> lighting because makeup on to get light. Yes, glow. and then me, 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 I try drip my water and mind my business. <laughs> yes, mind mind was it mind your business? I leave people business alone. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I'm leaving people business alone. Mm-hmm. But welcome. Thank you so much um, for, you know, just having the conversation with me. Um, you and I kind of lost touch over the years, but we met um, over um, when I was at Jamrock and you were doing PR work. So yes. we got to catch up a little bit and tell the people a little bit about your career and how you got started in PR and communications. Yes. So I think it was around the time when we met in Miami, I was working with Big D. Uh, He was signed to uh, Sylvia Rohn and Universal Records. So he had his own production deal. So we were working um, with his artists. So he had a production deal with uh, I can't remember the the artist's name, but he had a group that he was working with. But I mean, he's worked with everybody from like Little Wayne. um, uh, Let's see, Flo Rida. What's the name of the uh, Pretty Ricky? So he worked with everybody in Miami. And I want to say that he maybe did some stuff with Jay-Z, but he's an um, award-winning producer. So I started my career off with him and he really showed me the ropes and the industry. And that's where I really got my footing in the music industry. So I did PR back then and just with artists, brands, um, athletes and things of that nature. And for me, I think that, um, I wanted to elevate more. So I left PR, the boutique side of it alone. And I ended up going into corporate working at um, Viacom and um, MTV. So I did that in New York and um, just learning the corporate structure of everything. And I think that's where a lot of people, if you didn't go to college for business, it's really good to see the back end of these big corporations, because, you know, owning your own business, is just not, oh, I got a website and Instagram and that's it. You have to know the back ends. You have to know the corporate, the legal, the finance side of it, the marketing side of it. There's, there's all these caveats. So um, I ended up going to Paramount and I stayed there for a couple of years and I made my transition to LA and It was really L.A. where I began to start my journey in the film and TV and media industry. So, you know, just going back to PR, PR was really my start and just gathering and gaining really, um, I want to say, all my relationships that I made over 20 years ago in PR, I still have them today. And that's just because, you know, when you when you deal with people correctly, in the beginning, you never know where that journey is going to take you. And you can call somebody up 20 years later and it's like, hey, I need something. Or, you know, what are you doing today? You know, I, I'm working on something. Let's collaborate. And just having like a really good, solid foundation, it helps you in the future. Absolutely. So talk to me a little bit about the differences between Mm -hmm. music PR and then media and television? Because there's got to be, although it's the same industry and a lot of things are similar, what are some of the stark differences um, that you can share with with us here, just in understanding? Music PR, I would say you're kind of working from the ground up, depending on the artist. Um, it's a different beast than film. Film is a little bit more corporate. You have to have a footing. You have to have very solid relationships in Hollywood and just the industry or else nobody's going to work with you in film PR. Um, And a lot of the studios have their own in-house PR companies and outside for that extra, for that extra help. But music PR, I would say is you have to develop relationships 
with artist managers and um, just that music industry and just kind of be really connected and in the know of everything. So I think that if you're going to start doing music PR, you should be, you, you need to be out and about. You, you just can't be on your computer. You have to have that FaceTime. And I know that we live in different times, but, you know, just really getting out there and making yourself known, making your presence, um, you know, known it's, it's really good. And just building those relationships, your relationships are key. So if you're not building good relationships, nobody's going to work with you. And I always say your net work is your net worth. And that can also translate into film PR. Um, I think with if you're going to do film PR and work with um, actors and um, working on big tentpole uh, movies, you definitely need to um, have come from a big or even a small boutique agency and then work yourself up to a bigger, bigger communications agency. It's a whole different, it's a whole different beast. You got to know the A-listers and the movers and shakers and the deal makers, especially with film. Would you say they're more of the networking and, and massaging of relationships in film and television than there is in music? No, it's both. You it's you, both. Have to, okay. you have to finesse those relationships. You, it's it's your relationships is what's really going to get you in the door. Do you have to have a college education? It helps, but your relationships are your net worth. Yeah. So tell me about a, a you know is a a yadi girl. First, you have to tell the people then where you come from and where your family <laughs> there. But I think as a as a Jamaican woman, you, you're ingrained, so you can't have just one thing. So how did you start your entrepreneurial journey? First, tell us about, you know, your, your relation to Jamaica yes, and, and how you started your entrepreneurial journey. So my roots are in Mandeville. My family um, owns one of the biggest sauce factories in Jamaica. I let people figure that out. It's the one with the little parrot, the little bird on the sauce. So if you're watching this, I'm going to give you a little homework. I'm not going to make it easy. Um, <laughs> but my roots are in Mandeville, and I always rep Shooters Hill. So um, those are my roots. And um, as a yardy girl, uh, my grandmother had me slaving in the kitchen at five years old. So I was doing multiple things, playing with toys, cooking, cleaning, because, you know, Jamaican people, you have to clean, <laughs> ironing. So I think it started with my, my, my family, you know, it was ingrained in me on Fridays, we clean Saturdays, we iron Sunday, we go to church, this and that. So it's like, I had this regimented schedule and it just translated into my my adulthood where, um, you know, I started doing PR, but then I had a day job because obviously I'm a I'm a single mom. And uh, let's see here. I like I like nice things. So we have to work and we have to provide. And, you know, so I started doing PR and then I said, hey, I love candles. I want to make my own candles. And I'm very, very big on like holistic living and, um, you know, just natural, natural luxury, eco, eco lux uh, products. So I did my research and I found coconut wax candles. So I did my due diligence and I began to learn um, the chemistry behind candle making. It's just not candle wick oil. No, there's a whole science behind it. And I went to school for olfaction. So that's one of my <laughs> my many things that I did. So I went to school for scent, for scent making, perfume making. We call it olfaction. So I went to school here in LA for it, and I can um, make and source perfumes. So I put that into my candle brand, and I have a candle studio here in my house. Um, so we started off with seeing Kendall. Then I started off making um, Irish moss during the pandemic. Cause I just saw everybody making it. And I'm like, is that Jimmy a kind of person? I make that. We, we've been making it. And then, and then I was just like, if it's not a Caribbean person, man, I eat it. <laughs> Cause them, them never clean it properly. <laughs> <laughs> and then you go on YouTube and then you see these uh, Novembers. I call them Novembers. You see them washing the Irish moss five minutes. They're like, Oh, five minutes. You wash the sea moss 
and then you blend it. And I'm like, what? You never clean it? You never soak it? <laughs> And put like a lime in it. So I um, decided to start my own Irish Moss brand and it's been doing well since the pandemic. And I, I, I thought it was funny at first. I was like, hey, daddy, Memek Irish Moss. And said, so, you know what, the, you know what that is for? And I said, everybody know what Irish Moss is for, but the American people don't. <laughs> so I go and teach them. So um, we were doing that and I still have the brand today. It's called Botanic Botanical Gold. And uh, we have three different flavors of Irish Moss, strawberry, almond, kind of tastes like caramel porridge. So when you're eating it, um, it, it, it's reminiscent of it. And we have the plain. So I've had a, a really big celebrity clientele. And that all goes back to my PR days and just having those relationships. So when I tell you having relationships transcend into everything that you do, because I, when I do my events, when I have my brands, whatever I'm doing, I tie that all in. And it's one big multiverse. No, that is amazing. I like how you are kind of taking what you, you're elevating your space by mm -hmm. what you've learned every step along the way. And I think that that is truly important. Yes. Um, so let, let's um, talk about your latest venture, mm -hmm. the Coda TV streaming network. So tell yeah. me a little bit about how you got into it. I know you have a background in film um, mm -hmm. and television. So what made you really want to start this streaming network and um, the content you got to tell us about what does CODA stand for? Let's start with that. So CODA Caribbean on demand, all in one place. Yes. It's a mouthful, but the acronyms, it, it but <laughs> it just, it just, it's perfect. Caribbean on demand, all in one place, which stands for CODA. And um, so the way it started is um, last year I, I left corporate and prior to that, I have been working in Hollywood. It's it's pretty much, let's say, between the African-American films, the Latin films, it's really just starting to get the recognition that it deserves over the past couple of years. And I would say that between the Black filmmakers and the Black actors, they have really done such a great job fighting and vouching for their rights and just getting awareness and just being at the same level as white Hollywood. So, you know, I have to really big up black Hollywood in that essence. Um, and within that subspace, you have all these little niche markets. You have the Indian market, you have the Latin market, you have um, the LGBTQ and there's the Asian market. What about the West Indian market? What about the Caribbean market? And for years I've been driving it into their heads, but it's just not something that maybe they're ready for or do they recognize it as being a big monster? So what I did by developing Coda, it's Caribbean content, Caribbean movies, Caribbean um, music videos. So it's really falling in the essence of what BET was back in the day, what Netflix was five um, years ago, to be five, six years ago. And they all started very small and they are a big, huge monster now. So there are other Caribbean streaming platforms. Um, however, mine is just a little different in the aspect of it's curated with movies, short films. Um, we have music videos. We like to bring awareness to new new talent and whether that's filmmakers, movies, short films, documentaries, and just really bringing this into just one hub. And I call it the multiverse because it's, it's multifaceted. It's just not movies and it's just not music videos. We're giving you culture, travel, and also Caribbean documentaries. And we also just added podcast. So um, we partners, partnered with a Road Ready TV and they have three seasons and it's the first carnival reality series ever. And it's really fun. It's, um, you know, it just explores what carnival is. And it's a, these beautiful people under one roof. And it just shows the different aspects of just their lives and are built around carnival. Because you have people that really, really build their entire life around carnival every year. So uh, we have season one right now. Um, 
and we will be premiering season two at Miami Carnival. And there's also season three. So I'm really excited about that. And we also have another podcast called On That Note. And it's just, a, there's one Caribbean host, she's from Haiti. And you know, it's it's a really great idea because we're really bringing everybody together in one hub because you go to YouTube and you don't know what the hell you're looking for. I mean, it's just it's just so vast with information. But, you know, when you come to Coda, you're getting Caribbean content on demand. <laughs> so all why is it all in one place, all in one place? <laughs> So why is it important? Why is the curation piece important? And how do you pick and choose what gets uh, or is there a team like that kind of does the selection process? And what is that like for you? So there is a team and we have a chief content officer. We have an EVP of market music marketing. So we all kind of work cohesively to curate good content because at the end of the day whether you're paying for it or it's free nobody's going to watch bad quality videos bad quality stories we're bringing good quality and really good story pieces that people can connect with whether you know we have stuff for the older generation for the newer generation and just somewhere in between when you like a little bit of everything um we also partnered with keeling reggae Keeling Reggae used to have all these DVDs on Jamaica Avenue and in Brooklyn, all the little Dutch Sketel videos. We got them. <laughs> and who doesn't like to watch the old stuff? Because, hey, you know, um, Sean Paul and um, Shaggy just put out a movie called um, Bad Like Brooklyn Dance Hall. It's a short film. It premiered at Tribeca Film Festival. And they talk about you know, just the origins of dance hall to where it is now. And yes, they do use foundational pieces from those old videos. So if you're looking for old videos and uh, to look at dances and sound systems and how they used to be back in the day and just seeing, you know, just some of your epic, your icons like Supercat, Dougie Fresh, um, Shaba Ranks, you name it, it's on the Coda network and you can watch those old videos in the vault. We call it the, the Coda vault. I really love that. You know how much I love old school anything. Um, well, let me not sound old. Um, <laughs> especially be <laughs> the young people said, no, nah, I don't uh, complain too much. But you know, <laughs> aside, aside, aside. Um, in terms of like Caribbean content and, and entertainment, what do you think is the biggest opportunity right now for the, the space itself? Oh my gosh, short films. I mean, you anybody can pick up a camera, but it's really capturing the essence of the story. And I think as young filmmakers, I encourage them to just, just experiment, go above and beyond. Does it necessarily have to be a Caribbean story? No, it, a story is a story. Um, you know, an experience is an experience. Capture it, um, you know, just test the cameras. Um, I know that one of the challenges for Caribbean filmmakers is not having the right resources or just the funding for certain equipment. It is expensive. And, um, you know, I encourage anybody watching this that, um, that wants to assist and help with um, any any students with film, reach out to me. Um, we're actually sponsoring one of the movie nights or the movie nights uh, in association with the Montego Bay Community College. It's called Movie Nights. And um, we'll be premiering six short Jamaican films once a month and you can buy tickets. And we're also um, sponsoring the tuition for one student um, for I, I believe with the film student body. So, yeah. So you mentioned, and you kind of talked about your career in, in film and television and, and executives not seeing the opportunity within the mm -hmm. Caribbean space. What does the app mean to that opportunity? I mean, you don't have to be a big filmmaker as long as the storyline aligns with the brand and it's, it's, it, it tells a story. There's something, something that we can connect to that we think the audience will connect to. We want it on the network. Um, you know, you may put it on YouTube, but we want it on our network as well. You know, when people come there, we just want to have a hodgepodge of Caribbean filmmakers because it's, 
when I say it's not just a certain demographic that's on there, we, we have executives on there. We have directors on there. We have um, studio heads actually registered on the app and they're looking, they're watching. So I had one person say, I never knew uh, this about Jamaica. This is so cool. Um, who shot this? Are they available? Where are they located? So you never know the opportunity. And this is why I want to bring everybody together under one hub. Um, we also promote your Instagram handles um, just so people can know where to find you. And we also list the directors and the filmmakers and the actors just like Netflix. So when you're going through Netflix and you want to know who the cast members are, you can actually see who the cast members are on the network as well and the, and the directors. So this is so exciting. I know you're kind of still in the beginning phases, but what are some of the plans and things? I know you don't want to give away too much, but what are some things that are in the pipeline in terms of where you're looking to grow um, in terms of um, just development plans? So right now, we I, I call it phase one. So we're in phase one. But I would say by the end of the year, how we want to grow, I want to bring on sports. Um, football is major in the Caribbean. And just with everything that the uh, the reggae girls have been doing, I want to bring I want to bring them onto the network, whether it be live TV. We are going to have live TV as well, um, whether and, and also pay per view. So I can't I can't speak on this major event that we're doing in Jamaica in the next couple of months, but we will be live streaming and pay-per-viewing a really big event. So uh, you can come on the network and just like pay-per-view, you pay 20 bucks or 30 bucks. And also we'll be having um, additional channels on there. So um, we want to have uh, original programming. We're working on some films right now. Uh, we'll be going down to Jamaica and just getting some of that content. Um, and I can't share everything right now, but we are working on some really big things right now. And they're going to be Coda exclusives. And we're working with new filmmakers. We're just working with anybody that, you know, has a vision and aligns, pro aligns with the brand. So, yeah. What would you say is the biggest challenge in the space of just streaming networks and content for you um, right now? I would say it's just really devising, you know, right now there's a SAG um, AFTRA strike um, and they're mad with streamers because it's like, how, how do we calculate and how do we monetize, you know, just the content? Where, is, where does the analytics go? Um, I think that's one of the biggest challenges is just really um, how do you monetize and how does the, um, the actor or the filmmakers or just the studio houses receive profit from that. So, you know, we are working really hard and diligently with other Hollywood executives to find the right balance. So that, that is one of the challenges. I'm aware of it. Um, I am definitely on top of it. And it's something that, you know, um, coming up, coming onto the network and, you know, obviously there is, there has to be a monetization piece for the for creatives. So we're, we're currently working on that right now. But um, I, what, what I can say, it, it will be profitable for everybody. Amazing. So tell people how they can access the network. So you can download it via Apple, what is it? Apple Store, the Apple Store and the Google Play Store. And we will be on um, Android TV next month, Roku. We will be on all the platforms that you can think of. So just give us about two months. Um, <laughs> but right now you can find us on Google Play Store and the Apple iTunes Store. And you can download it to your phones and watch it. And, and you can actually Chromecast it to your TV and watch the films. So you're not on your phone um, watching a movie. Correct. I love it. I love it. I love it. All right. So in terms of, you know, the, the, the podcast is called Style and Vibes. We got to get into your style and your vibe. So um, tell me a little bit about your personal style. Ah, my personal style. I love classic pieces. I love vintage pieces that I can wear and interchange all the time. You might see something that I might have worn three years ago, but I'm going to remix it. I'm not going to go buy something new. <laughs> if I don't have the time, we're going to remix it with some belts, some earrings. We're just going to change it up a bit. I love, I love, I'm very, I love sleek 
sleek, modern, clean clothes. I think that I really loved back in the day, I would say I love dance hall fashion. So that was my favorite. But how do how do we make that sophisticated? How, how do we not have our cheeks hanging out? <laughs> or hanging out. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so it's like really finding like this, I don't know, just finding this medium balance. So Jay Alexander of FUBU, one of the founders of FUBU, said to me one night at an, at an event in New York, he goes, you know, you're kind of hood bougie. I love your style. I was like, okay, I'm going to take that as a, as a, as a compliment. But the fact that he, Jay Alexander even said that to me, I was like, okay, he's paying attention to my style. He says, I, you know, I got a little, little hood bougie. Okay. The personality <laughs> kind of comes through when, like in the first look. So them know them can't mess with you. Exactly. So them, them, can't, them can't step to you. Them, them have to come with a certain, certain, you know? Yes. So I love, I love, I like to mix it up. I like to, I like sexy and sophisticated and clean. So that's, the, that's my style. And I would say that, you know, I'm not into um, designer names um, advertised all over my bot, like all over. That's, I'm not a walking billboard. So my style is very uh, incognito. I could be wearing a $3,000 outfit and you would, you wouldn't even know. <laughs> And I love vintage fashion. Girl, give me a fur. Listen. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love yes. it. All of it. I love it. Yes. So what, what is currently on your playlist right now? So currently on my playlist. Okay. Let's look. Let's go to my title because the title is fun. First okay. title of your playlist. Let me, let me hear it. First title of my playlist. Oh, shit. You're like, I can't, I can't share that one. No, 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 it's good. <laughs> okay, okay. That's 90s hip hop and R&B <laughs> style. Yes, yes. All right. So, now the Bashment playlist. All right. What's about on. the Bashment playlist? You need, okay, let me let shut. No, no, this is not even my playlist. What, what is going on? What is going on here? I don't like this. Hold on. Oh, here, here's, here's my, um, let's see if it, it will, if we'll go. Hold on. Oh. <laughs> That's what he said. See, Jay was right on point because he said hood and bougie because you draw for some tune that they get out of yeah, the R and B with Total, but and, and hip hop. I don't, I don't know if that was the remix or not. It, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, yeah, it was the remix. Them. <laughs> so you have you got your little ditty bop, and then I go into my gunman stone man tunes. So you know, it's I'm I'm a, I'm a cross of both. I'm a, I'm a good I'm a good a, a good balance. <laughs> <laughs> it makes perfect sense. Thank you so much, Lexi. I truly yes. appreciate you being on the podcast. Um, tell the people where they can find you. You can find me at Lexi Chow underscore and at the Coda Network. So follow, share, like, tell a friend to tell a friend. <laughs> awesome. And until next time, later, my peeps. <laughs>